Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, the runner-up in Sierra Leone's election slams the process. Samura Kamara rejects President Julius Madabia's re-election for a second term, saying that the winning tally was cooked up. Also, as the cost of living goes up in Kenya, the country's main opposition calls for disobedience from their followers over the latest raft of tax hikes. And the Wagner mercenary group's aborted rebellion in Russia raises questions about its African presence. The Kremlin, though, has insisted that the mercenaries' operations on the continent will continue as before. But first, Sierra Leone's president, Julius Madabio, has been re-elected for a second term with over 56% of Saturday's vote. EU observers have already flagged a lack of transparency by the Electoral Commission as leading to popular mistrust in the process. And Madabio's main challenger, Samura Kamara, has already rejected the results, saying that they're not credible. Our regional correspondent, Justice Baidu, joins us now with more justice. So what does this uh, re-election of Madabia mean for the country and, and why is Kamara already crying foul? Well, Georgie, the celebrations on the streets of Freetown, uh, Sierra Leone's capital, has been uh, one of mixed feeling uh, amongst many people, uh, in part because this country is one that is heavily polarized and divided. In fact, tension had been building ahead of this election. And Mr. Madabio, who is now, has just won his second term, um, had com competed with Dr. Kamara in the, the similar fashion in 2018. And it, the, the election was this close. And so this time around, especially with the anger that had been building up with uh, how the country's economy had done over the last few years and, and in most parts of uh, Mr. Bayo's uh, first term, many were expecting that there was going to be a change, but that seemed not to have happened. Uh, Dr. Kamara has immediately rejected the result uh, and has described it as daylight robbery. Um, it remains unclear what his option is going to be. Um, the observers that had come from the African Union and ECOWAS had described the process as having been peaceful, free and fair, and had asked that if anyone was unhappy with the result, uh, they should seek uh, legal redress rather than ask their, their supporters to go onto the street. Um, Mr. Bill, who is now just be going to begin his second term, faces a very tough challenge as the country's economy has seen a big uh, downturn in the last two years. The uh, Leon, which is the country's currency, has seen up to 80% depreciation against the dollar in the last two years alone. Cost of living uh, has risen by up to 150% in the last two years. And we went to I, uh, we went to Sierra Leone to speak to many people to gauge their mood, especially speaking about the economy and the cost of living ahead of this election. Many people speak about how challenging times have been. A lot of the, the, the consumables that people use in the country are imported. And as they are, the currency uh, has depreciated that much, it has uh, impacted uh, people's livelihoods. And people are hoping that things will change in Mr. Madabio's second term. In this supermarket in Freetown, Sierra Leone's capital, customers are finding it increasingly difficult to fill their baskets. According to the manager, an Indian who has been in the country for just over two years, business has been slow since the Leon. If we compare from the previous time, the exchange rate is very high. Suppose now we have to pay more taxes to the government also. That's why the inflation is coming now. And plenty of people there, most of the people, they don't have the money and they don't have the buying power also, that's why. In Sierra Leone, almost half the population live on less than $2 a day. The recent 150% increase in food prices. It's really, really hard for us to manage our lives nowadays because things are really going up. With a trade deficit and high levels of imports, the country is highly dependent on fluctuation in its currency. On the informal foreign exchange market, however, players are noting a brightening trend. Dollar is going down every day. We usually buy 24, 
but now we are buying now 21. When the currency comes down, maybe the price will go down. You see, so the commodity price will go down. When the Leon starts to rise again, commodity prices remain high, according to professionals at the exchange office. Traders don't pass on currency trends. When the dollar goes down, prices aren't going down in the stores, so it's a bit difficult for the locals. Dollars have come down, but everything is going up. Last year, Sierra Leone removed three zeros from its currency in the hope of restoring confidence in the Leon. Well, thanks very much, Justice, for getting us up to speed there on the, in the, the context within which Sierra Leone's election was held. In other news, Kenya's opposition leaders called on his supporters to join him for a political showdown with President William Ruto's government. Rilo Odinga is demanding a boycott of a raft of controversial new taxes. Master Renui has more. Thousands of people gathered here in Nairobi to listen to the opposition leader, Raila Odinga. During his speech, he denounced the new taxes that are going to be implemented by the government of William Ruto. Among them, uh, the uh, VAT is going to double on uh, petrol products, and there will be a new 1.5% tax on every salary in uh, Kenya to finance a new affordable housing uh, program. It's unacceptable, according to him. It's going to uh, affect many Kenyans. Listen to his supporters. The living standards of Kenya has gone up, and there is this finance bill that has been passed in parliament uh, by the Kenya Kwanza government, which is going to increase the cost of wealth, the cost of food, the cost of everything will go up. And Kenyans are overtaxed now. We are suffering, we are, our salaries are not up, yet the taxes are going up. The recently uh, signed finance bill that we William Samoy Ruto has assented into law. We not fully refuse it, and we are saying as a people, we shall get to the streets and demonstrate very highly to make sure that this government goes home very early in the morning. During his speech, Haila Odinga said that his coalition, Azimula Umoja, tried all the ways possible to stop these new taxes. They uh, spoke in the parliament, they went to the courts, they even went to uh, churches to try to pray against these new taxes, and uh, none of these actions uh, worked. So this is the beginning of a new movement, he said, to uh, try to stop these new taxes, but they uh, just have a few days remaining. Uh, they will be implemented on the 1st of July. Bastia Renoui there for us. Now, the weekend's aborted rebellion in Russia by the Wagner mercenary group has raised questions about the paramilitary's African presence. Wagner has its biggest footprint in Central African Republic and Mali. The Kremlin's insisted that its operations on the continent will continue as before. Andrew Hillier has more. Despite Wagner's failed rebellion, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov insists the group is here to stay in Africa. Wagner allegedly has its footprint in several countries across the African continent. The group is particularly active in Mali and Central African Republic. Roughly 1,500 of its mercenaries have been stationed in Central African Republic since 2018 to defend the government against rebel attacks on the capital. Vitaly Perfilev is Wagner's man in Bangui. He reportedly fought for Wagner in Syria. Dmitry Siti handles civil affairs. Both men work closely with local authorities, handling security and defence matters in exchange for access to natural resources. Wagner has a tight grip on the economy and works very closely with the government. But what's uncertain at this stage is whether both men's sympathies lie with the Kremlin or with Yevgeny Prigozhin. In Mali, Ivan Maslov calls the shots for Wagner. He's a former Russian Special Forces soldier, and he was in direct contact with Prigozhin, for whom he organized meetings with the heads of several African states. Unlike in Central African Republic, Wagner is less dependent on local power, but relies more on the Russian army for logistical support. It's unknown at this stage whether or not Maslov supported Prigozhin's failed rebellion. Well, 26 Ugandan environmental and social campaigners have filed another legal case here in Paris against French oil giant Total Energies. The civil suit is for damages for the alleged land and food rights violations commit allegedly committed during the company's operations, including those for the East African crude oil pipeline which will span from Uganda to, Tanz to the Tanzanian coast. Now, five French and Ugandan groups accuse Total Energies, which is the major shareholder in the pipeline, of causing serious harm by preventing free use of land and property and offering affected communities too little compensation or unsuitable replacement housing. As I'm a project affected person, 
My home was where central processing facility is built. My home was there, but uh, the conflicts came when I went for disclosure to me and Madame, I, we ask for a settlement. But Total, as the oil company, insist I take cash compensation, which his length I cannot enable me to build a home somewhere. Total's project has impoverished thousands of people. It has expropriated people from their land, people who made a living from their land, with no means to live for years, and now they find themselves with compensation that comes too little, too late, too little to restore the living conditions that are at least equivalent to those they had before. Meanwhile, this week, Nigerian authorities and energy group Shell's local subsidiary headed out to the site of a spill on the Trans-Niger pipeline as part of an investigation. The spill on the 180,000-barrel-a-day pipeline was detected on June 11th, but campaigners say it took a week to be contained. Caroline Lambele has more. It's a familiar sight. Blackened waters in the Niger Delta and adjacent farmland soiled by polluted water. Environmental activists say nothing was done to contain the oil spill for over a week. Comparing that kind of spill with what we have had in Ogoni before, I think uh, well over 15, 16 years that we had that kind of spill before. That was the kind of spill that happened sometimes, uh, you know, in the mid-2000 in the border area that led to the payment of massive compensation by Shell. That is the kind of spill that can be likened to what we currently have on ground. It's so massive. It's so massive. Nigeria's National Oil Spill Detection and Response Agency has said that the spill came from the Trans-Niger Pipeline, which is operated by Shell and crosses through the Alema area of Ogoniland. Shell has confirmed that there has been a spill, and this week it sent officials to the site, along with Nigerian regulators and local officials. The aim was to gather information and assess the causes behind the incident. In the past, the oil giant has blamed several similar occurrences on pipeline vandalism and illegal tapping of crude oil. Faced with backlash from local residents and following deadly unrest, Shell stopped production in Ogoniland more than 20 years ago. Years later, the oil giant announced it would provide funds to clean up the area, which suffered heavy pollution from the oil industry. Well, that's it for Oil in Africa for now. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Till then, take care. France 24, your window on the world. Liberté, égalité, actualité. ありがとう。励ましてくれてありがとう。ちょっと兄貴もあのほら、バルでしょ。ね。私はもうね、もうはい、もう自分で一人で言う先見たから逃げてきましたね、もう悲しい。うん、これが最後かなって多分もう帰